Well, here we are at the wonderful Hard Rock Cafe Memorabilia Archive in Orlando, Florida in an address that will go unmentioned. And uh, this is where we collect everything that is displayed in the Hard Rocks throughout the world. There are 33 of them now, so we think of ourselves as one museum with 33 outlets. And uh, these are just some of the guitars that we have. Uh, basically, the whole idea is to collect, uh, catalog, store, and then select, prepare, and display the uh, icons of rock and roll and pop culture. And like any collectible, there's a range of uh, there's kind of a range of items in the collection, uh, from the sort of cheap but fun plasmatics Les Paul, which was sliced in half with a chainsaw on stage by the famed Wendy O, to a beautiful 1959 Fender Stratocaster with the original tags, formerly the property of one Jerry Garcia. And as you can imagine, there's quite a range of value between those two items. Tony Iommi, no, don't worry. B-52s played in the Flintstones. Steve Cropper, greatest R&B guitarist of all time. Prototype Rosewood Telecaster used on some of your favorite R&B classics. What else we got here? Ooh, ooh, for the kids out there, it's the Eddie Van Halen 5150 guitar. How about that? And for some of the old folks, Jimmy Page, 12-string Vox, used in the studio. Probably not for any bands we would recognize today. He was a huge studio player before getting famous in Led Zepp. What else we got? Robert Cray, kind of watered-down blues player, but they love him. <laughs> uh, uh, who's that guy, Rachmaninoff? Who'd he play with? That's a joke. <laughs> This fucking crazed drunk guy came into the Hard Rock in Orlando claiming he was Billy Squire's guitar player and gave us this piece of crap with all the painting and the very pretentious Rachmaninoff written on the side. Turns out he was just some drunk skeezix who never played with a pro band in his life. But more often than not, sort of a promo opportunity for them. Then we, we buy it cash, you know? And we get it at auction, and we get it from a constant stream of inquiry that comes to us that we filter through and chase. So, so you can see this pile of stuff right here. This is actually being prepared for the uh, hard rock that will open in Copenhagen about June of this year. And all these things you notice, I have these white sheets of paper. Those are all the framing instructions and they're about to be recatalogued so our database can keep track of it and then it'll go to Dallas where it'll all be framed and prepared for display in Copenhagen. And a few of the items are this actually quite rare poster featuring The Who's last performance of the rock op opera Tommy at the Fillmore East in New York. And this is a funny jacket. Ozzy Osbourne, classic spinal tap. He had it made. It weighs like 40 pounds. He took delivery of it, put it on and went, I can't wear this on stage, it's too heavy, and gave it to the uh, dancer girlfriend of his drummer, who later turned it over to us. Uh, that poster actually is quite valuable and real cool, because, oh, and it's behind this incredible Diana Ross of the Supremes doll by the Ideal Company, but this poster is actually promoting a show Buddy Holly did in England about 1958, or maybe it was seven. And uh, so that's what you got here. This funny little the little shot there. That's uh, that's a photo of Woodstock that was in a, the crowd that was printed on a two-piece suit. And that's just a piece of the suit there. And oh, my assistant Spike's not here, but he apparently has been wearing one of Jimi Hendrix's jackets. I'll have to speak to him about that. It's a very broad collection. In these drawers here, we keep all of our posters and flat filed in numerical sequence. You know. Something with by Kitaro and John Anderson signed by both. I don't know if that's that interesting. Let's try another draw for the mystery selection. Bob Dylan signed by the, the king himself. Is he the king? No, Bob Dylan. And uh, as we walk down the line here, it's kind of cluttered. We got, you know, the Beatle display of toys here. And in fact, all of these shelves are both Beatle toys. Everything from these Bob and Head dolls here remember them, to what they call the real hair beetle dolls. It's nylon, don't be worried. 
And, you know, they pretty much made a little of everything about the Beatles. My favorite, I don't have on the shelf, but it's the Help Band-Aid dispenser. No, no uh, first aid cabinet is safe without one. And uh, over in this section, it's all photography. And I'll pick out a few guys. What do we got? Roy Orbison, George Harrison, more Beatles. We're heavy in Beatles. We're heavy in Elvis. You can't not be heavy in those two. And uh, as we move down the line, gee, want to read about the Beatles? Here's a few books about them. Personally, I've had enough of them. Well, we maintain a full collection of Rolling Stone magazines, which we uh, set up kind of in six-month grids. It's really fun because it's a snapshot of the news at the time. And uh, over here, we enter the clothing section, which uh, actually is packed a little tight. Got uh, Elvis, Elvis feeling a little uh, crazy. This is uh, little Steven, Steven Van Zandt of the Disciples of Soul, formerly of Bruce Springsteen's E Street Band. Nice Lou Reed costume here, very rare, early 70s with a photo that goes with it of Lou looking somewhat scrawny and pale. Nevertheless, oh, who could this be? Everybody knows who this is. It's Madonna. It's upside down. It's Madonna. Elvis, another Elvis piece. He was kind of into karate and America, as we all know. And, uh, ooh, Rod Stewart. I see a Rod Stewart tag. Uh, that sure looks like something Rod would wear. Very diaphanous and sheer. You know, do you think I'm sexy? I would guess. So that's the clothing. And then we come driving down this uh, little uh, hallway. We actually now have a hat collection, apparently. <laughs> King Creole and the coconuts. I had to look for the tags. I'm afraid I can't just pick them out anymore. I have a feeling that looks very Elvis. Who's that? John Entwistle of the Who. Nice. Beaver felt. Harrods of London. Who's this? This is Elvis. I knew it had that Elvis feel, and there it is. The King showing his tremendous style sense when he's made him famous. And. Here we are in the framing room. And this is where we frame everything, and anyone who knows about framing knows how that works. There's a nice costume over there. This is Stevie Nicks. Uh, probably around the period of rumors, gee, she seems to have a little dandruff. Sorry about that. It's a little hooded velvet item, which I venture to guess she couldn't wear anymore because we're all getting older. Perfect, perfect. So here we are, and we're wandering down in the bowels of our archive. Here's a very nice item. It's already ready for display. This is the way it would be displayed, except it would be lit up in the restaurant. And it's a pair of Keith Moon's pants, Keith Moon being the late drummer for The Who. Little photo of Keith over there on the left and his bass playing partner, John Entwistle. So these are called Bob and Head Beetle Dolls, and that's why they call them Bob and Head Beetle Dolls. They look really good on the back dash of my Cadillac Seville. The Beatles were merchandised to death. There's also, whoa, 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 let's see what I can get, there he is. These are the Beetle real hair dolls with guitar and facsimile autograph, your assurance of quality. Whoa, this thing's heavy. In more ways than one, you might think this was Elvis's suit, but if you look carefully, how could Elvis possibly wear this in the 70s? He was quite a bit wider than this. However, it was made by the guy who did make Elvis's suits, a gentleman named Bill Ballou, and there's his name. This particular suit, though, was made for Donny Osmond. That's right, ladies and gentlemen, the Osmond brothers. And here we have the compatriot suits that go with his brothers. Whew, getting an arm cramp. How heavy is that? It's not as heavy as Elvis's. <laughs> <laughs> Elvis's is like, 